It's a subject that we really don't like talking about, but death is a fact of life. Over 320,000 Canadians die each year. And as our population ages, there's a growing need for palliative care designed to ease suffering in our final month. The Canadian Institute for Health Information has just published its second report on palliative care. The good news? More Canadians are getting some form of -of end-of-life care than they were five years ago, and more are dying at home, their preferred choice. But there are also signs that many who need it aren't or can't get it because of who they are or where they live. And that troubles our guest, Dr. Naveed Dasani. I'm here to tell you and and tell listeners that absolutely every Canadian should have access to palliative care because palliative care is the right thing to do. Dr. Dasani is a palliative care specialist who works at St. Michael's Hospital at Unity Health in Toronto and who has also set up Canada's first palliative care service for the homeless called Peach. He's also the medical director at Kensington Hospice in Toronto where we went to meet some of the patients and families and to talk with them about what good palliative care means to them. Without palliative care, the the answer is simple. Mom would have been hospitalized and would have died in hospital a long time ago. Hello and welcome to the Canadian Health Information Podcast. We call it The Chip for short. I'm Avis Favreau, the host of this conversation. A note, the opinions expressed here don't necessarily reflect those of Kai Hai, But this is a free and open discussion, and this episode is all about Kai Hai's report on access to palliative care in Canada. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Dasani. Thank you so much for having me on, Avis. So let's start with the fact that you are one of a few doctors in Canada who have basically dedicated your life to palliative care. What was the, the interest in this area? Was there an event uh, or a case that triggered your interest? Exactly. There was a a case uh, that I was dealing with when I was a resident at the University of Toronto working um, at a local men's shelter. He was a man in his early 30s. Um, He uh, had a widespread head and neck cancer and he was shaking. He was writhing. He was curled into a ball. And as I examined his mouth, I could see what was causing him distress. It was this cancer that started at the base of his tongue and spread throughout his head and his neck. And he was experiencing significant pain. I learned that he was actually diagnosed with cancer one year before, and due to an unfortunate sequence of events with his mental illness, he wasn't able to follow up for care. So the tumor grew, he started to experience pain. He went hospital to hospital, seeking the kind of pain control that any person should have access to. He wasn't given pain medicines. And so he found himself in our care in crisis. I got to work the next day and I couldn't find him anywhere. Terry had died overnight. Um, His body was found in the early hours of the morning. He had overdosed on a combination of alcohol and street drugs. Um, To me, this was a very traumatic event in in my training to see that in a world-class city like Toronto, where we have world-class healthcare, that someone like this felt could fall through the cracks. And um, I guess, you know, that really um, launched um, me into this uh, passion for health equity and access to palliative care as a human right. Do Canadians, all Canadians, have a right to palliative care? I'm here to tell you and and tell listeners that absolutely every Canadian should have access to palliative care because palliative care is the right thing to do. It provides uh, appropriate medical care, pain and symptom management, emotional and psychological support for people at a time when they're most vulnerable dealing with serious life-limiting illnesses. But it also provides support for caregivers and families during a difficult time. And it It actually makes sense from a cost effectiveness perspective, from providing care to the right person at the right place at the right time. It's actually an efficient model of care. And so, yeah, it it, it is something that every Canadian should have access to. But unfortunately, we're not quite there yet. And that's why we're here today to talk about this Kai Hai report. So it's the second report that Kai Hai has done. And we've learned that data is critical to understanding what's being delivered Are you improving? Are you losing ground? So let's talk a little bit about the report and where are we based on what you saw? Yeah, so it's not every day that we get access to um, uh, the kind of picture that is being provided in this report and the and the kind of picture that is actually a, a national coast to coast perspective of how we're doing as it pertains to palliative care. 
in 2018, the government of Canada released a framework of, on palliative care in Canada, establishing what is supposed to be the blueprint, uh, our, our goals and our hopes for what palliative care will deliver. So let's break it down. The good news is that compared to the last report, there are more Canadians getting palliative care. It went from um, up 6% from five years earlier to a sort of national average of 58%. What's your reaction to that increase? You know, some people might say that 6% is not a lot. And I'm here to say that um, actually in the world of palliative care, it is a lot. Um, and so actually, this is a fantastic achievement that needs to be celebrated. We certainly have a, a long way to go, but it's something that needs to be celebrated at this point in time for sure. But it does suggest that when you look at the data, it goes from as high as 59% in Ontario to a low 50% in the Yukon. So only half of those who might qualify are getting palliative care. So there's, yeah, there's, it's not a consistent picture across the country. Absolutely. When it comes to um, location and geography across the country, we see quite a bit of variation, which is likely a product of the kinds of systems that have been developed um, and are in the process of being developed in their, in their stages of evolution, so to speak. Um, but it also speaks to other issues that need to be discussed, such as urban and rural divide. Um, while access to palliative care was relatively equal um, between rural and urban areas, what was, uh, what was, what the report says is that patients who were living in rural areas were actually more likely to be hospitalized primarily for palliative care compared to those living in urban areas. And they were actually more likely to die in hospital compared to those in urban areas. Areas. So even when we had that equal access, technically, we saw different outcomes throughout the tra trajectory when it comes to palliative care as it compares to urban and rural. So that was an interesting finding also. Was that a surprise to you? You know, to me, not necessarily, uh, simply because of the concentration of services that we tend to see that exist in urban areas uh, as compared to rural areas. And it really speaks to the ways that we have a long way to go to develop um, pro pro probably more novel and innovative ways to support rural care. So one of the other questions or one of the other windows that the report gives is where Canadians are getting palliative care. So the vast majority of people, when they're surveyed, they want to die at home. That would mean home care. Uh, that The rate of that went from 7% to 13%. We're getting home palliative care. Is that good news? You're smiling. Yeah, I, I'm so happy. This is, this is incredible. It nearly doubled, basically, um, since last measurement. I think, you know, we, we have to also remember that uh, for some people, home is not a stable environment to receive care. And as someone who provides, uh, as a, you know, palliative care for people who experience homelessness and other structural vulnerabilities like poverty and homelessness, sometimes metrics like this are unfair um, because, you know, when we say home, what do we mean? Are we talking about uh, 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 you know, a three-story, you know, house in a, in a suburban region, or are we talking about a shelter, or are we talking about long-term care, for example, which was also discussed in the report. So happy to see the outcomes, but we have to remember that home means different things for, for, pe for different people across this country every single day, and not everyone is set up in the right environment to receive that kind of care at home, and that's why our systems need to be agile and flexible. We were um, allowed to film at uh, one of the places where you're medical director, and that's the Kensington Hospice in Toronto, uh, 19 beds, a beautiful building. And one of the uh, people that we met was Julian, he's a 70-year-old man with end-stage cancer. And he told us that he did want to stay home, but the home care was spotty. So I'm going to play a clip of what he told us, followed by a comment from the hospice executive director, Dr. Nadine Persaud. After I had my blood transfusion, I was in extreme pain and I couldn't, I couldn't function myself. I used to sleep on my easy chair, my gaming chair, with my feet up on the, uh, the hospital bed and the bed and the chair separated. So I had to wait 30 minutes for the fire department thing. How many times did you have to call 911? I think three times. The home care I had didn't speak English. So there's one time I phoned them to get out of the bathtub. So if you could have, you would have preferred to be at home. Yes. So I prefer to stay at home. And now you're here. Yeah. And so we, I think I was asking you earlier about people calling 911 
when they don't have phone support. You've seen that. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen that often where people have no other resorts like to call um, EMS or call 911 and the fire truck company will come to support. And I think often of people who don't have the capabilities to call and who will just end up on the bathroom floor until their next PSW comes to visit or a caregiver comes um, because of the lack of resources. Does Julian's story highlight some of the problem with home palliative services? If people want to die at home, but it's not there they end up like Julian needing more help. Yeah, you know, Julian's story is uh, a story I hear um, quite often from people and is the story of many people across Canada who would have loved to have stayed at home if they had had more access to resources by way of home care. And actually, our systems make really significant assumptions. One of the biggest assumptions is that um, is that you have other people in your life. You have other caregivers, family members, support systems that will fill in when publicly funded home care um, uh, is not around. And the raw reality is that there are many people who don't have those kinds of supports and aren't able to privately pay for those supports. And so um, when you talk to folks um, in, in hospice, um, I, the vast majority if not all of them say, yeah, I would have loved to have been home. I'm only here because home there wasn't enough home care to support me when I needed that support. So now I'm here. And so institutions like hospices are obviously very important and they, you know, they're needed. But if we expanded our, our home care systems and provided more resources for people, more people would be able to stay at home. And when it comes to palliative care, more people would be able to stay at home for their end of life care. That would be the goal. That would be the goal. So where are most people in palliative care dying based on the report? Yeah, unfortunately, what we're seeing is that still a significant proportion of people are dying in hospital. And from a cost uh, allocation and, and resource perspective, it's actually a very expensive way to do things. You know, hospitals do play a role. The idea is that, though, when folks are using the hospital, they're using it at the right time and they're using it for a short period of time such that um, it's not actually the place that they stay for long periods of time. So one one of the things about the CAHE report is that the hospital seemed to become a default when there was a crisis. And I've heard that palliative care should never be a crisis. But they were ending up in hospital because there was a seizure or there was some sort of problem. And the Kaihai report says that uh, some 44,000 end of life patients who went to the emergency department for some sort of palliative care, the majority, oh, 66%, like were admitted. They were unplanned and one in four died within 24 hours. What happens when someone who's near death and is palliative is sent to hospital? that way? What does it trigger? Yeah. So um, a lot of people might think, oh, like, you know, go to the hospital. It's the right thing to do. It's, it's, it's the best place for a person to be. Well, in, in reality, what it often means is that people are going into a system where they're kind of put on this conveyor belt, where they're now going to be admitted to the hospital. They're going to have, uh, you know, they're going to get poked for blood work. They're going to have investigations um, and they're going to have a multitude of tests uh, that they would have never really wanted to have in the first place. That's not a great thing because it's not a place that always has that emphasis on quality of life. Now, many hospitals like the one I work at has have done a really great job in implementing and growing palliative care consultation teams and having palliative care beds in hospital, but we still see this all the time. And that's why there's so much effort being made up front to prevent hospitalizations to begin with. Uh, the, yeah, I believe the report talked about how in Prince Edward Island, they're training uh, paramedics, first responders, to be able to identify when someone's in a palliative situation, see if they could stabilize them at home rather than put them on that conveyor belt. Absolutely. I think the paramedics project, which is being piloted in in many provinces across Canada now, is a really great innovative use of existing health human resources that really can make such a difference upfront and upstream and prevent, um, you know, visits to the emergency department and ultimately hospitalizations. I also think that another innovative, you know, intervention has been training up our health human resources across this country around, you know, primary uh, palliative care skills. And there's a, a 
training program run by Pali in Canada called the LEAP program. And LEAP has, um, you know, done incredible work coast to coast training professionals um, from all disciplines about a palliative approach to care. And the more that people know about these issues and have these skill sets, the more they're going to be able to intervene up front. I also think about the role of virtual care. I think about the work that our palliative care outreach team does for people experiencing homelessness and thinking about the, the special and vulnerable populations that need that customized and tailored trauma-informed support to be able to support care, to keep people in community where they want to be if they want to be there. And so it's, it's likely a multi-pronged approach and these kind of innovative solutions are important. The idea of delivering more palliative care out there, not at the hospital. I would imagine it's pretty expensive at the hospital too. It must be agonizing to be at end of life and they have to do routine blood tests, routine CAT scans. Absolutely. One of the things that um, happens uh, quite often when I'm providing palliative care in a hospital, and a lot of my advice actually stems around stopping investigations and tests. And you, someone might think like that's a little strange and it's, it's actually quite a relief. It's a breath of fresh air for patients and their loved ones because now they're not going for those CT scans. They're not getting that blood work anymore and they're being listened to because what people actually want at that stage and phase of life is they want their quality of life addressed. So we, we call that demedicalizing and de- demedicalizing is a big part of what we do, particularly in the inpatient hospital setting in palliative care. Now, we've talked a little bit about hospice, but for people who don't know um, what hospice care is, this report did highlight hospice care. Um, I counted there are 36 residential hospices. I thought there were more than that. What are they and what is the role of the hospice? For sure. They are typically um, accessible to people who, uh, for whatever reason, can no longer continue to receive their palliative care at home, or sometimes are uh, sites that receive patients uh, uh, who have received uh, palliative care in a hospital, for example. And uh, really, you know, the the raw reality is we don't have enough hospices across Canada. Uh, The raw reality is that um, hospices are not fully funded across Canada. And in many provinces, uh, uh, the provincial government offers a proportion of coverage for operational costs. And in many places, capital uh, investments are not covered at all or are covered for a very small portion. And so um, it's actually very expensive uh, to create these institutions. And even when they're created, hospices are often having to fundraise to make up the difference. With that said, hospices are incredible places to receive care. They are community oriented. They offer um, uh, uh, different kinds of supports that you wouldn't see in a hospital that someone might not have access to at home, like music therapy, art therapy. And it just provides a sense of community around a time that is very sad and very difficult for many people. I think a lot of Canadians would like a hospice as an option, but there's few spots. And one of the uh, things that the Kai Hai report identified is that at least half said they were always or usually operating at full capacity. And the one we were at obviously was full. And I spoke to your colleague there, Dr. Nadine Persaud, who's the executive director. And not only was it full, but she said there were three or four at least on the wait list. And they they seem to arrive late in their illness. The average stay, she mentioned, was three weeks before they pass. This is Dr. Um, Prasad talking about what she saw. We hear of people in the community dying before they can get to hospice. And when you look at the amount of hospice beds in Toronto, it seems as if sometimes it's like the lottery to get a hospice bed because there's so few hospice beds that it's so hard for people to get access. So it's not unheard of for us to get referrals and say, Mr. So-and-so died or Mrs. So-and-so died before admission. It's become so normal because we know referrals aren't made until the last minute. How do you feel when you hear that? I think it's really disheartening. It's upsetting to know that often if people are not dying with palliative care, that means that they're likely dying with existential distress and they're dying suffering of other things that we don't even have the time to discuss. Grief anticipatory grief, loss, so many things. Dr. Dasani, are too many referrals being made too late in the palliative process? Absolutely. We are identifying uh, uh, the need for a palliative approach um, uh, too late in, in the trajectory of too many people across Canada. Why? 
in many places across Canada, and the Kai High Report talks about this, there is the use of these checklists that really reference these uh, tools. For example, the palliative performance scale score, which is really scores function for a palliative care patient from zero to 100%. And um, often, you know, people are only thinking about uh, initiating a palliative care approach when someone has dropped below 50%, for example, and has a steady uh, decline. That works for cancer and solid organ cancers actually, you know, fit that profile. And that actually allows us to provide early palliative care quite easily. But how does that work for someone with COPD or heart failure or someone who's had strokes or multiple strokes where someone can be a solid 50 for a long period of time, for example? So some of it is that we've applied um, some of these checklists uniformly across the population. And what we need is a more tailored approach. The other thing is that I think even in our primary care and specialty care systems, there's still, even to this day, is somewhat of a resistance to initiating a palliative care approach earlier in the trajectory, even when we have so much evidence to show that people feel better. And even in some disease states, like some cancers, people actually live longer if they get early palliative care. Well, that begs the question, when should palliative care begin? Your colleague, Dr. Prasad, said three months for hospice care, uh, but we met a woman who was there um, at, at Kensington Penelope and her son, Mark. She uh, was diagnosed with advanced multiple myeloma, which is a blood cancer, correct? And uh, she started palliative care earlier than most, which was around the time of her diagnosis. And they deemed it palliative at that point. Here's a clip of Mark about his mother. How long has your mom been here? Here since December 16th, so three and a half months. What kind of difference has it made to her quality of life and your quality of life? Without palliative care, the, the answer is simple. Mom would have been hospitalized and would have died in hospital a long time ago. If mom had not had the pain management, which was facilitated through palliative care, she would have gone into hospital. So instead of costing the government a couple of hundred dollars a day, it would have cost $20,000 a day, and she would have been there for some period of time. So, Mom, how do you like this this place? I think that makes a big difference in how you find those last days of your life and to spend them with their own families and that kind of thing. What does Penelope's story tell you? I think Penelope's story is a reminder that palliative care is a powerful tool that should be initiated at the earliest uh, time possible. And many of our national bodies in palliative care, uh, if you go and look up the definition of palliative care and when it should be started, uh, talk about really palliative care should be starting at diagnosis. Even in the Kaihai report, we see that people who get access to home and community care for palliative care actually are less likely to end up in hospital because they have that embedded support in community um, to meet the person's goals. I do want to comment on, on uh, Dr. Persaud's comments about less than three months of life. And I do agree with her that often that has been the definition of hospice um, care or what many call end of life care. And so remembering that hospice and end of life care usually encompasses the, the last days to weeks of a person's life. And often in many, many provinces, it's talked about as less than three months, but palliative care encompasses the larger trajectory all the way from diagnosis towards end of life and even the bereavement phase. And so Penelope's story is really brings home the power of a palliative approach to care. It's a real success story, if you ask me. Um, who isn't getting palliative care in Canada? What worries you? I think once again, the Kai High report emphasized that people with cancer are predominantly getting access to palliative care, and people who have diagnoses like dementia um, are not often getting access to palliative care. That's very concerning, actually, when you when you really think about it. The majority of people over eighty five are not getting palliative care. Yeah. And it's probably because we built um, a system that is very much focused on um, the, the trajectory of cancer. And the report also shows that people in different ethnic groups, different cultures are also less likely to get palliative care. Yeah, we continue to see through and through that racialized Canadians are not getting equitable access to palliative care. 
my sense is that um, racialized people do want access to a, an approach to care that alleviates suffering when they're dealing with a life limiting illness, but they're often fearful of the term palliative care because of the ways that we talk about palliative care. The language we use, the, the lexicon, the approaches um, typically are more, um, you know, one size fits all approach that has really actually been designed for a more Caucasian population in our communities. And so we need more culturally safe approaches to talking about and delivering palliative approaches to care. Um, that can mean many things, including, you know, uh, offering palliative care delivery and information in different languages to representation. We need a workforce that reflects the population um, that is actually delivering the care. You know, more training around what culturally safe and anti-racist approaches to care and palliative care can look like. And finally, We've literally gone out and created a system that delivers palliative care to people, and we called it home palliative care. And it's not semantics. We literally designed a system that left out a significant proportion of Canadians that lack um, you know, stable housing. And so people who experience homelessness and various forms of homelessness across Canada suffer every single day. They don't get access to, to palliative care because there's no system that's able to deliver that for them in community. And that's why the PEACH program, Palliative Education and Care for the Homeless, our mobile street and shelter-based palliative care program that has been developed um, and evolved over the last and grown over the last year, nine years in Toronto. We now have programs in Victoria, Edmonton, Calgary, and I think it speaks to the fact that there are many people in this country who realize our systems are not designed to meet every person where they're at. And that's rewarding for you. I can see you get very, that's close to your heart. You help them die on the street, right? Sadly. Yeah, wherever a person calls home, home, we respect that. I think many people listening would say, well, I would never want that for myself. But we have to remember that we can't project our hopes of what a home looks like or what a good death looks like on people. And that for many of the people I care for um, in Toronto, um, you know, uh, home is actually a shelter or a respite or a drop-in or a friend's place. And can you do good palliative care in a shelter, in a tent? I think if you carry um, a, a, a big heart and you and you um, and you bring forth compassion and you are trauma informed in your approach, we can do anything. When we go out and we meet people, um, you know, often they're kind of at first a little bit resistant in the sense that you know they find it strange that a doctor or a nurse or a social worker is spending so long with them in a setting that typically healthcare doesn't go to. Well, actually, you know, they say, well, what's the catch? This is this is kind of weird. And, and and as we go back and we build that trust and rapport, they're like, this is this is really amazing. You know, as one man said to me the other day, I have avoided healthcare for a really long time because healthcare has been very mean to me. And now that you guys come to me and see me in my shelter while I'm dying, well, this is what healthcare should always look like. And I, yeah, I found that really powerful. One of the things about the Kai Hai report, uh, shifting focus a bit here, is, is caregivers. They took stories from caregivers, the people who have to deal with their loved one dying. What does the addition of that or what were the messages from that component of the report that hit you? A lot of what happens in a palliative care trajectory actually impacts caregivers. Um, and, and ultimately, the sequelae of ineffective systems falls on caregivers um, and their caregivers, too. Right. And so I, th I think it's 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 a really important voice to have. What we heard peppered throughout this report is that when um, when our systems fail, caregivers are the ones who are filling in. And they are um, providing that care um, that isn't always being documented. It's not always being counted, but it's a lot of care. The volume of care being provided by caregivers is important. And you have to think if all the caregivers across this country one day said, we're not going to do this anymore, we'd be in a really bad spot. Caregivers are the reason our health system and especially our palliative care systems in community are able to move forward. What also came forward in, in their narratives is that we must do more to support them. There needs to be more access to care and supports. There needs to be more clinical resources. There needs to be more financial um, supports for caregivers who are taking time off of work um, to support uh, folks. And, and I think that that doesn't get talked enough about. So where do we go from here? We've got a snapshot. There's some good things. There's some gaps. What comes next? 
Yeah, I think that, you know, we have to celebrate some of the incredible improvements that we have seen around access to palliative care, access to community and home-based palliative care, the development of systems uh, coast to coast to really get people the kind of care they need um, when they're dealing with, um, you know, serious life-limiting illness. Do you find that the provinces are responding? Because I understand that Ontario and Quebec are putting more money in and there was some money put in federally. Yeah, so there are pockets of excellence where we're seeing uh, particular provinces like Ontario and Quebec that have earmarked specific money, uh, particularly, for example, in the area of hospice, uh, to be able to expand care. But it's it's just the beginnings. It's it's really something that needs to grow and it needs to grow quite quickly. I'm also concerned about the variants across the country, considering this is a, a, a country where I know, everywhere people are dealing with palliative care issues. Why is one province giving more uh, to this issue than another? I think we need more of a more of a uniform approach to these situations. Um, I, I do think there's a few issues we need to really zone in on. Uh, we, we recognize that, you know, most you know, Canadian primary care physicians are having end of life care discussions with patients somewhere around 94%, but only 40% actually feel prepared to have the conversation. I'm actually spending a lot of time with practicing uh, uh, family physicians around how to have serious illness conversations and how to have the goals of care discussion, how to bring up the topic of a palliative care approach for people. These are, you know, deep conversations that require time and how can you have a conversation like this in a 15 minute appointment right those are some real um, issues that need to be discussed uh palliative care and maid i have heard that some patients have said i don't need palliative care i'm having medically assisted death but i've also heard that some patients who request medically assisted death once they get palliative care they don't want medically assisted death in some cases, when people are, are um, you know, uh, exposed to what palliative care can offer, they say, oh, I didn't know this was an option. I didn't know this existed. Now that I know this existed, exists, um, I, I don't think I want to pursue medical assistance in dying. And then in other cases, people say, this is really great. Thank you so much for offering me this palliative care. And I will risk continue to receive this. But for other reasons, I still want to pursue medical assistance in dying. I think the way forward in palliative care, Canadians have spoken. They want access to medical assistance in dying. I think we need to respect the different trajectories that people experience and need to be humble and and have humility in our approaches to supporting care for patients, no matter what their trajectory is. So to sum up, uh, we know that there are improvements, but we know that there is a ways to go. What would be your hope in the next report? Yeah. So in, in, in the next report, my hope is that we see less variance across Canada, province to province, region to region, by way of funding and, and, and uh, supports that are being provided around palliative care in community. For example, hospice funding would be a really good thing to see more of and more equity in across provinces from, uh, uh, and territories. Um, I think that the second thing I would really like to see is a robust um, you know, strategy that really, you know, empowers and supports primary care physicians and primary care healthcare teams to initiating a palliative care approach, um, such that it allows us to shift the conversations from downstream to much earlier upstream. That might mean a new funding envelopes for, you know, uh, billing codes that support, you know, conversations like that. Um, and the third is I'd, I'd like to see uh, in a future Kaha report more robust data about the experiences of people who, who are going through different kinds of structural vulnerabilities across Canada. I'd love to see a breakdown on income, on housing status, on mental illness, um, looking at people who use uh, substances as well, because I think if we really are serious about a health equity approach to palliative care, we will drill down to those specifics. Without the data, we won't know where to go. Well, I hope you I hope you get your wish. It is. It's very important, but it's also so such a big subject. But at least your sense is it's in the right direction. Absolutely. We are totally moving in the right direction. There's uh, absolute reason for us all to be hopeful and that we should use that hope to drive more change in the future. And I hope we are having that kind of conversation in the years to come. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Dasani. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. 
Kai Hai's palliative care report can be found on our website for a closer look at the data and the implications. Thank you so much for listening in. Our executive producer is Jonathan Kuhlein. And a shout out to Alia Yang, the host of our French Kai Hai podcast. And if you want to learn more about the latest Canadian Institute for Health Information data, please go to kaihai.ca, that's C-I-H-I dot C-A. And subscribe to The Chip wherever you get your podcast. I'm Avis Fabro. Talk to you next time.